Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. It is an honor to be here in front of you again to speak and share the Word of God. Uh, this morning we will be studying the book of John. Uh, we'll find that the book of John is very different compared to the rest of the gospel. And we find uh, as we study the book of John, many other denominations does not like the book of John and they have argued that it should not be part of the Bible. But as far as we are concerned, the Seventh day Adventist Church believe that the book of John is there for a very beautiful purpose. And that is why this morning I would like to be with you and to study the book of John together, all right? But before we start, may we have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, O oh Lord, we come into your presence again in this beautiful Sabbath day. I pray, O oh Lord, as I speak your words, it will be your words only and not mine. That, O oh Lord, I will hide behind the cross. That, O oh Lord, your Holy Spirit will take control over me. That every word that come out of my mouth will be yours and not mine. Forgive us all for our sins and bring the Holy Spirit into our hearts to convert us, to give us a change into our minds, to give us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding as we study your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. This morning I entitled my message, uh, But Now. You know how you always talk to someone and we have this uh, sandwich method of rebuking or correcting someone, am I right? You can say uh, five good things to someone. But if you say, including that five, if you say one bad thing, they would focus on that one bad thing, you know? So that's why we have the sandwich method that uh, if you want to correct someone, it is best to first compliment of something that is good and to bring them at a good mood. It also shows your intention that I am not here just to prove you wrong. I do not only see your mistake. I see what good you have also. But there are some things that I need to correct you. So we will go on and say, you know, you have been a, a very good singer. But sometimes you scream and it's not so nice. People's ears are hurting. But overall, we, are very, we appreciate your courage of singing up in front. And then they go like, ah, oh, you know, he's, he's not here just to offend me. Or sometimes when you propose to a girl and you tell them how much, you know, I have longed to be your boyfriend. But the girl doesn't like you the same way as you like them. So they say, yes, you know, you are a very nice person. But I don't feel the same way. The word but is such contrast. There is such contrast in it. It's such opposite. It can never be the same. It's not I like you, but I love you. It's always I like you, but there is something else. There is something wrong with it. And the but will always bring us separate ways. It can never be together. So that's why we have to differentiate. And we have to experience what is being called the but now experience. And we'll get to know what is the but now experience, okay? If you look at the book of John, as most of you like to read books, you'll find that before you buy a book, and if the book is being sealed and you're not allowed to you know, open the pages and go into it, you know, you have the trailer of the book, and the trailer of the book usually is behind, am I right? And you'll read and you, they'll give you a, 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 what is this? a summary of the, the book and you decide whether you want to buy it or not. And most of the times you'll go right to the back of the page. For some of us, we like to read from the beginning. We don't want to, we don't want to watch the trailer. We don't want to know the summary of it because we want to, to what? be surprised at every point. But if we study the book of John, it might give you some benefit reading from behind. If we turn into the book of John... John chapter 20. Let's, 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 let's go to John chapter 20. 
All right? In the book of John, chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, John tells us the purpose of why the book of John was written. And once we are able to understand and know why this book was written, then we will look from the beginning on, we will look at it in a different perspective already, am I right? If you know this book was written for a specific purpose, your aim and your goal is to understand that specific purpose in all of its stories, in all of its testimonies. So here in the book of John chapter 20, verses 30, John writes here and says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in his book. There are many miracles that Christ has done, which is not written in the book. In verse 31, it tells us the specific purpose. It says, but these are written, the book of John is written, that he might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing he might have life through his name. You find that this book is just not a book of knowledge. It's just not the book of John. The Gospel of John is just not to simply tell you of the historical event. But rather to convince you at all point that Jesus is Christ. That Jesus is God. And there is something special about Jesus. And if you study the four gospel, you'll realize that the book of John has the most one-on-one -on -one encounter than the four gospels. It brings so much joy that Christ does not only preach in public to 5,000, but Christ does not only preach to multitude, but he also preach one-on-one. -on -one. He is also not the God Almighty, he, but he is also your God, the friend. God, your brother. God, who is there for you when you are alone. And so that we realize that even the verse John 3.16 was not said out in public. It was a personal conversation. When Christ said, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, the only begotten Son, that whosoever believe in Him shall not perish. It was a one-on-one -on -one conversation. He was speaking to a, Pharisee, a rabbi, a Pharisee, that came to Him at night, Nicodemus. And that was when Christ spoke to him about his love. And so we find that Christ is just not this big person, but he's also very personal, very interested in the very things that you do in your personal life. He's also very interested in the, every struggle that you're going through. The struggle that you might be so ashamed to tell anyone. The struggle that you might be so ashamed to even confess in public. Christ says, I want to know about that problem. I want you to share it with me. I want you to take that problem and put it to me. I want you to trust that problem with me. To summarize the book of John, I would have no time. But I would like to summarize the book of John in one of the stories. If we can go to John chapter 9, would you turn to me together with John, to John chapter 9? John chapter 9 verses 1. We are very familiar with this story, but yet again, it is a blessing for me when I read it again. And I would like to share with each and every one of you this morning. As we look at John chapter, one, uh, John chapter 9, verses 1, it says here, And Jesus passed by. He saw a man which was blind from his birth. You see, when we study the Bible, we got to read as if Christ is talking to you, especially in the book of John. Imagine that you are sitting in a room with, John, uh, with, with Christ alone, and he's sharing with you. You, you got to imagine that, all right? And usually, the best time for discussion is when you are one-on-one, -on -one, am I right? For example, in a sermon, uh, I don't think so. If everybody started having a question... I may not be able to understand and no, I may not be able to answer them and it cannot, be, it cannot turn into a discussion. So before the, the sermon, we have Sabbath school and of course then people wanted to know more and they have personal questions. They go one-on-one -on -one Bible study, am I right? 
So imagine that as you're reading the book of John, imagine that, that Christ is speaking to you and you and Christ are in the room alone. And there it was saying that you have to have questions in your mind. What is going on? And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. Why was Jesus passing by? For us to find this answer, we just have to go a few verses behind. If you look at uh, John chapter 8, verses 56, I'll read it here in John chapter 8, verses 6, verse 56. John chapter 8, verses 56. It says here, and Jesus was speaking. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Verse 57, Then said the Jew unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? And verse 58, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Amen? And then look at verse 39 and we will understand why was Jesus passing by. In verse 59 it says, Then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them to pass by. What was Jesus doing? Jesus was running away from his life. Somebody was trying to kill him. And it's not a gunshot. It is not an immediate death. This was stoning. Do you know how painful stoning can be? Because it does not kill you directly. And Jesus was scared of... Oh no, Jesus was not scared. Jesus was running for his life. And as he was running for his life, yet he was there passing by. And when he was running for his life, he even had, he even had the time to notice a blind man. How many of you have ever run for your life? Has any one of you ever run for your life before? Yes? Oh, praise God. So there you can ask how it feels like to run for your life. When running for your life, you know, you become a, the most selfish person there could be because all you worry about is your life and you want to make sure, the ultimate goal is to make sure that you survive. That is the purpose of it. I, I have not run for my life, but I have run away many times. But you become very selfish, you know. There was once, it is not very easy to care for someone else when you know your own life is in danger, right? Even in, in all the emergency cases, we are known that we are supposed to protect ourselves first. Once we know we are safe, then we can go and maybe help others or best to call and, you know, call the emergency people. You know, when there's a fire, you have to get out first. When there's an emergency in the aeroplane, you've got to put the gas mask first before you put for the baby. And, you know, you've got to take care of yourself first. But here we find Jesus, a total different character. I remember once when, when uh, I was going kayaking or canoeing into the sea. We were there and, you know, uh, friends would like to challenge each other. So we were canoeing and we canoe into the middle of the sea. And... Uh, ice, as usual, would overturn his canoe and let everyone drop into the sea and some of them were, were not brave enough, they would be shouting and they would be overturning. But we have done that many times. Me and Jeremy was in one canoe. We have done that so many times. And, no, I'm not interested. It's boring already. But there he comes, you know, what are you guys scared of? You know, all this, this challenge and making fun of us and, you know, pride comes in, you know. What, you think I'm scared? So there we go. Me and Jeremy stood up of the canoe and said, we're going to jump off the canoe. So we say, one, two, three, we jump off the canoe. And as soon as we jump off the canoe, Jeremy, the place where Jeremy was jumping, had jellyfish. And there he was when we jumped in, he got stunk by jellyfish and he was shouting, jellyfish! And his hand was being, uh, was this, being st stunk by the jellyfish. And what, in his, what was in his mind was, I've got to save myself. So he saw that I was beside him. He hold into my life jacket. He pulled me towards the jellyfish and he swam away and I got stung by the jellyfish. It was so painful. But you see, when you are running and your life is in danger, all you think about is yourself. I don't blame him because I believe if I was in his situation, I would have done the same thing as well. So there I was, I got stung by the jellyfish and I was so upset. And we went back up and realized the reason why we went down was such foolishness. But imagine Jesus 
And, and this right here tells how much Jesus, whether his life is in danger, he's concerned about you. Whether if he was going to die, he's more interested in your life. So there he was running for his life and he passed by. But look at verse 2. In John chapter 9, verse 2, it says, And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? We all know that the Jewish culture was that when you have a defect, a disease, or something bad has happened to you, it was because of sin. But I would like to read from the desire of ages, Yes, yes, it is because of sin. Yes, it is because of sin that death is in the human race. Yes, it's because of sin that many diseases have formed. Yes, it's because of sin our emotions are hurt, people are betrayed. Yes, it's because of sin. But in Desire of Ages, page 471, paragraph 1, it says here, Satan, the author of sin, and all its result had led man to look upon disease and death as proceeding from God. So what, the, what Satan was trying to teach and the culture was strict was this, that when you sin, punishment or disease came from God. We know clearly it does not come from God. The book of Job is clear. Satan wanted to disturb Job. He wasn't God who says, Oh, this man is faithful, let me disturb him. Temptation does not come from God. But the people so believe that it was God who was punishing you, and they will criticize and judge. You see, this is the reason why you are having this, because God is punishing you. But no, it is because of our mistake. It's because of Satan. If we had not sinned, which God wants us not to sin, they would have no pain in our body. There would be no disease and defects. So this was the culture that they had. But Jesus said this in verse 3, And Jesus answered, Neither had this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifested in him. Sometimes, the gift that God gives us is including our problems. Some of us don't understand, Lord, why am I suffering with this sin? Lord, why am I suffering with the addiction of lust? Lord, why am I suffering with the addiction of pride? Why am I suffering with the addiction of gambling, of temper, and each and every one must ponder upon this problem. Why, O oh Lord? But did you know that even your, your problem was a gift? How, how is it a gift? It is a gift that because you have this problem, God can work a miracle through you. God can work a miracle through Saul. We find in our Sabbath school lesson, that Saul was going around murdering, but yet God can work, you see. He can change a man's life. We can take our problem and turn it into a testimony. You see, as long as Satan lives in this world, our world will not be perfect. Why do I come from a broken family? I do not have a father figure. I don't have a mother who loves me. I don't have enough money. I come from a bad neighborhood. We can all say this, but God says, they are just not only you, and when you come and follow me, then you can be a testimony for those who are struggling the same struggle as you are. So God, so Jesus was saying, this is not a curse. This was so God's work can be seen. So that God can use you as a testimony. That your life is so much in a mess and God says, you know, your life is in a mess. But He can turn that mess into a message. 
Some of us are so deep down caught and we are a victim of sin. And God says we can turn you a victim into a victory. And so he was, Jesus telling them, it is not God who's bringing all this pain. And when you have this pain because of sin, God is there to show his work. If we continue reading, verse 4, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night commands where no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Such promise that God has given us. In verse 6, he says, when he, had, when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and met clay of the spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay and said unto him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, Siloam which by interpretation sent. He went his way therefore and washed and came seen. You find that in many situations, Christ wants you to experience His power. You realize that for this man to walk, listen to this, the man is already blind. And Jesus come and put clay, and we, we clearly know that that clay had no power. We clearly know that if Christ were to say, Open up your eyes, he will be able to see. But there he was, making that clay. A blind man putting that clay in his eyes. And he says, go and find that, that, uh, that pool to go and wash your eyes. And this man had to go up. And Christ did not lead him there. He had to go up. People know who he was. He was there for years. And he had to go up. And that is what? Faith and works playing together. Most times we say we believe, but there is no action taken because we are afraid that our reputation would be affected. So we say, yes, I believe. And we sit down and say, I believe. We do not stand up and voice out. We do not stand up and move. So this man had to take and stand up, not knowing who Jesus was had to go into the pool and look for the pool and I believe he's going around and asking, where's the pool? And there he was, not knowing. You know, have, have you ever prayed for a request and put a deadline to that request? And not knowing, oh Lord, is it going to happen? Is it not going to happen? You know, you have, you have a deadline, you know, and the deadline is so near. You're praying, Lord, is it going to happen? Maybe some doubt is there. Some unbelief has grown. So this man there is walking to the pool. And there he was. He has never seen before. But he's going. He took the water and washed his eyes. And the first thing he saw, what do you think is the first thing he saw? Was Jesus there? Where was Jesus? Jesus was not there. And the first thing he saw when he washed his face in the water was himself. When you follow Jesus, you see your true self. Do you guys get that? When you follow, when you follow Jesus, you see your real self. You see your real value. That you are out of dust that God has made you special. That you are nothing without God. That you are full of sin and in need of a savior. When you follow Jesus and finally God opens up your eyes, you realize that you cannot live without Christ. You have to experience that. If you're following Jesus and you still find yourself as perfect as you will always be, then there's something wrong. If you follow Jesus and, and you're down on your knees and you feel that you have reached righteousness then there's something wrong if you have not cried and say oh lord i am the biggest sinner then there's something wrong so there he was he saw for himself and he came back and people were questioning him 
Look at verse 8. The neighbors therefore and the neighbors therefore and they which before had seen him that he was blind said, It is not is, is not this man that sat and begged. Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. And people are telling, Is this this man? Is this man? Yes. When Christ has changed your life, you don't care about your past. You say, yes, this is me. I am him. He, that's what he said. He said, I am he. People, there are people that will always talk about your past and will not let it go. People will, not, people will always remind you of who you were. Yes, I have friends who have reminded me of who I am. Because they have not seen that part of me. You know, they have not seen how God went. They, have, they didn't see, you know, in, in high school. We left in high school and it was only after high school that I, I finally found God. And they're like, so, they are, they, are, they are like so stunned, you know, so, so you don't curse anymore? Then I say, yes. They were school friends, you see. So, what if I make fun of you now? And I say, yeah, well, of course, I, I don't know. I, I say I don't know how I will respond, but I would love to respond by either keeping quiet or if I'm too upset, I would rather leave instead of scolding you back. They say, what if I want to fight with you? Such ridiculous question, you know. And say, are you sure? Come on. And then they would try to tempt me and all this thing. They would try to remind you and saying that you cannot go away from your past. But once Christ has changed you, nothing is going to bring back, nothing is going to bring you back to your past. And there will always be people who remind you, but you will be testifying and say, yes, I was. I was that man. But now, I am changed. Not because I could change. But because Christ changed me. And we continue looking at verse 13. It says, Then said they unto him, Where is he? He said, I know not. Oh, oh sorry. Verse 13. Uh, they, brought it to, they brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Verse 15, Then again the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said unto them, He put clay upon my eyes and I watch and, and, I wash and do see. Verse 16, Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracle? And there were a division among them. You see, I might not be able, or you, I might not be able to explain to you the prophecy that is so clear. Or explain to you the 2,300 days prophecy, or how exactly and specifically the century is. And, and all this theology uh, debates that's going on, that is a difficult verse that I may not be able to explain because of my knowledge. But once you have this personal testimony with Christ, once you have experienced Christ first-handedly, reasoning and logic cannot take you out away from that faith. You can tell me there's something wrong with the Bible, but I cannot, you cannot tell me that Christ is not real. Because Christ has worked in my life and I've experienced it single-handedly. And there's nothing you can tell me that is fake here. Because I have experienced it. A personal testimony. You see, a knowledge alone, with no conversion of a heart, is a book. A book full of knowledge. That is why this knowledge that we study is so that we can have a conversion of a heart. And when we have a conversion of our heart, our life will change. And you find that people will try to reason you out. People will tell you how the Bible is fake. People will try to logic it out for you. But once you have that first-hand experience with God in your own life, their logic will be foolishness. Their reasoning will be stupidity. And we continue reading. In verse 17, And they said unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him, that he had opened thy eyes? He said, He is a prophet. Verse 18, But the Jews did not believe 
concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight. They have even doubted that he was blind. They have not only come to say that Christ did not heal you, they have come to say that you were not blind in the first place. They are trying to spoil the experience that you have. I was reading Desire of Ages and it says this, but the Pharisee would rather deny the evidence of their own senses. All right, their own senses, not evidence of other people, but evidence of their own senses. They would rather deny the evidence of their own senses than admit that they were in error. They would rather be foolish. They would rather be stupid than admit the truth. Than to, to, to say that, yes, it really makes sense. Because of their envy and jealousy. When someone is sharing a testimony and sometimes we go like, was, was he really addicted to it? Maybe it's all in his mind. You know, when someone is saying, I have a struggle, this person cannot handle pressure. You know, I was in depression and, and Christ took me out. Gosh, this guy, this guy is so emotional. And what, are, we, are, we, are we saying that he, he did not go through depression? That Christ did not save him? Because when we say that Christ, and when someone shared that Christ has taken them out from a problem, and we look down on the problem, what we are saying is also that Christ did not even save them because there was no problem in the first place. So there was the Pharisees who were saying the same thing because maybe they were envy and jealous. You know, in the book of Our High Calling, I was reading it this week, it says about envy and jealous, that if we have envy and jealous and, and we talk bad about others, this kind of behavior cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Do you know why? Imagine you had envy and jealous and you, and you look upon others and like to speak of their mistake because you find yourself so imperfect. It says here, for those who enter heaven with envy and jealous, for they would criticize the angels. They would envy others' crown. They would not know what to talk of unless they could bring up the imperfection and errors of others. Angels are so beautiful. If we are here talking bad about human beings because we are envy and jealous of them, such imperfect creation because of sin, how much the more when we go to heaven and we see these beautiful angels? And so it was the Pharisees, they could not handle it. They even considered if he was blind. But if you continue reading in verse 19, and they asked them saying, is this, oh, they, they went to the parents and asked them saying, saying this, is this your son who he was born blind? How then do he now see? His parents answered them and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But by what means he now see, we know not. Or who had opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age. Ask him. He shall speak for himself. It clearly explains why the parents answered this way in the next verse in 22. It says, This word spake his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, that Jesus was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. There should be, what? This fellowship. In other words, in our term. In verse 23, therefore, said his parents, he is of age, ask him. You see, the reason why they were not able to know about Christ, the reason why they were not able to witness for Christ was because of fear. It was because of fear many times we are not able to see God's miracle. It is fear of failure, fear of believing in Christ that we are not able to see these miracles. So fear was in the parents. 
They were the background. They were the ones sitting down and hearing the testimonies and never could they share the testimony. Let us stop being the background. Let us stop being the one who's sitting down. Let us be the one that goes up and share the testimony. Let us be the one that witness. And for us to, to, to do that, we have to remove the fear in our hearts. Fear of what? According to the parents, fear of men. Fear of what men think of us when we share this testimony. Fear of what men will think when we share the word of God. So let us stop having this fear of what man thinks, but what God wants. So it was, then in verse 24, Then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. Verse 25, He said and said, Whether he is a sinner or not, I know not. Listen to the verse 25 because this is the climax. He said, he answered and said, Whether he is a sinner or not, I know not. One thing I know, that wherein I was blind, now I see. I was blind, but now I see. I was a drunkard, but now I'm sober. I was a sinner. Now I have a savior. We need the but now experience. If you want to follow Christ and our life has not changed from what, has, what it was to what it is today, if there is no change, then what has Christ done in our life? Because every single time Christ has come in contact with a person, life changed. It goes the opposite way. When I used to be addicted to games, now I'm addicted to studying the Word of God. When I first wake up, the first thing I look at on my phone is Facebook, but now I pray. We need to have a but now experience in our life. What we were before and what we are now has to be a big difference. It has to have a change then people will realize that there is a change. Because God brings change and change for the better. And then he go after sharing his testimony many times to the Pharisees. His Pharisees keep on asking again. He answered in verse 27. He answered, I have told you already. And he did not hear. Therefore, would he hear again? And he asked this question, will he also be his disciple? Do you want to be his disciple that you're asking me so many times, how did Jesus make me see? Do you want to know about him? Do you want to, do you want to be his disciple? Do you want to follow him? That's what he was asking the Pharisees. Because the Pharisees could not, make, could not accept while they know is the truth in their mind. They'd rather be foolish than follow the truth. But as for this blind man, he was able to experience God firsthand. He was able to say, I was blind, but now I see. This morning, as I close the message, the only important thing we are here is to have a change in life. Because God will not only give us knowledge for knowledge's sake, He'll give us knowledge and understanding so our hearts can change. Each and every one of us need a but now experience. We know the song, am I right? Amazing Grace. And we have understood that grace is not only the safety net when we fail, but that grace is also the power that gives us victory over sin. The grace of Christ is the one that gives us a but now experience. And I believe each and every one of us are looking for that experience, am I right? Let's close our eyes for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, O oh Lord, 
We want to know you. We want to have a change in life. Each and every one of us are looking for change to make our life better for your kingdom. So I pray, O oh Lord, please send your Holy Spirit into our hearts. Give us a but now experience. Give us a change in life. And let us surrender our life into your hands. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.